who tend to to be more um, impulsive than others. And this, some of us came out with an earlier witness, but the general research is, as it deals generally with males, is they tend to be more impulsive until full brain development at age 25. That's correct. Okay. And obviously, they're, that's not a hard and fast either. Some, some may have it earlier, some may have it, some may have it later, but that, that's one of the ways where they talk about why males tend to have more impulsivity issues than females is because their brain doesn't finish that development until a later point in time. Whether we like it or not, females tend to develop uh, more quickly or mature more, more quickly than what males do and tend to be less impulsive than males. Okay. Um, so given that what we know about the, the male juvenile brain, what does or does not deter that juvenile from doing something? I'm not quite sure what you're asking there. Can you restate okay, so that? So, obviously, our goal is always to deter children from doing bad things, meaning to others, or dangerous things that may affect them. So how do we deter, if everything they do is impulsive, how do we deter anything that the juvenile does? Well, one of the things that we do, I mean, I've built a lifetime of practice on this, is that there has to be assistance provided to parents to help intervene when they see their child misbehaving, to foster the idea that when you do this, it leads to this, and these are things that you could have done instead that doesn't lead to this bad outcome that could have been a more beneficial one. In this particular case, what I would say is that the best deterrent, and I, I, it's, it pains me, frankly, to say this, the best deterrent that should have happened in this case was an accurate diagnosis of autism spectrum back when this child was much younger. And so then you're speaking of specific deterrence, meaning how we, how we could have deterred this juvenile I'm talking about different. specific treatment for autism spectrum disorder that could have provided a different set of coping skills uh, than the ones that he ended up developing without much in the way of parental supervision. Right. So you, would you agree then that if someone is educating a juvenile not to do something like this, to talk about, well, these are the serious consequences you can get for this. So you need to avoid these serious consequences um, and not do this sort of behavior. I mean, I just one would hope that it would be multifaceted, that mm -hmm. you would just be like, you understand when you kill someone, they're not around anymore, and you end their life forever. But it, you, as you mentioned, it could be multiple facets by which to educate them. This is gonna be very serious. You're gonna be treated as an adult. Do not do anything where you could harm someone else and take their life. Wouldn't that have a deterrent effect? Then? Given my, my profession, Mr. Newell, I would say to you that my first place that I start in working with children who have behaviors that are concerning, the first place I start is not in seeing the child. The first place I start is in seeing the parents. That's the, that's the first place I start. Because responsibility here, this is why we call them children. They're not mature. This is the part that where we've had multiple legal precedents that talk about the fact that children are not held to the same level of responsibility as adults are. But in order for children to be able to mature, they need to have parents who are sensitive, who are nurturing, who are not neglectful, who are not demonstrating behaviors that are endorsing drug use, and also that they're not being exposed to situations involving uh, drug overdoses. And culminating in death. And, and I don't disagree with you, but I'm just trying to, the, the question I'm asking is, well, just, I'll make it me, me, the hypothetical me, is that explaining all the consequences to my daughter, um, say my daughter's 13, and explaining to my daughter the consequences of this sort of action, you're that in conjunction with other things, you would say would have a deterrent effect. Me parenting out and telling my daughter the consequences of her action 
will help to deter the, her from doing this sort of action. So what I would tell you as a father, if I, if I was working with you, is that your 13-year-old daughter is on the verge of being able to take perspective and independent thinking. And if you were to share that perspective, she may resist you at first, but she was going to hear that. The differentiating factor in this particular circumstance is that your daughter, I suspect, doesn't have autism spectrum disorder. Because you can't use insight to intervene in the life of a child with autism spectrum disorder because they don't get it. They're focused on routine. They're focused on uh, doing things the same way. They're compulsive. And if you try to interrupt the routine, you will provoke an adverse response. And so that's where you have to look at this in terms of being developmentally contextual and that what you do takes into account that diagnosis and the clinical signs that define it and recognize that in this particular situation, insight, you can be as insightful as you want to as a dad. And you're going to be frustrated because it won't be heard. But insight will work if my daughter does not have any psychological or cognitive limitations. Insight works. Insight will... relevance. We're not talking about a person who have, that doesn't have the autism spectrum issues. This child does. So let's talk about what's relevant and move on. How loud is cross-examined? Answer the question if you can. Will you restate it, please? The insight for a person without any sort of cognitive or um, emotional or mental limitation, insight works. The more insight I give them, the more likely they are not to do that. Insight would be one of several steps that can be helpful, but it would not be the only one. Thank you. Yeah. Nothing else, Your Honor. Mr. Mr. Newell spent some time talking about this hypothetical idea about insight with his daughter about some issue about learning what to do or not to do. Do you have an opinion about whether any of that hypothetical matters at all in this case? When I look at taking the evidence that is generated during the course of an assessment, I have to interpret that evidence within the context of a diagnosis, within the context of a developmental history, and within the context of a family history. I think that uh, you know we can talk about things in general, and I, I appreciate that, but it's not specific enough in terms of understanding who this particular defendant is and who he was at the time of the offenses. That's the part that I have, that I, my responsibility has to focus on is who was he at that time and what were the determinants on his behavior that resulted in the terrible, terrible tragedy that occurred. Um, Mr. Newell spent some time discussing your report and the phrasing of the topics that you use in your report in relation to what the questions are for the court's analysis pursuant to the statute. Mm -hmm. So what I want to just make sure I understand is that you aren't, you weren't asked specifically to do the court's job in answering the questions under the statute you were asked to provide an assessment and an evaluation addressing the information that the court needs to have in order for the court to make its determinations under the statute. Is that right? I am very firmly of the mind that it is irresponsible and unethical for me to, put, to decide ultimate issue. That's not my job. So. The statute tells the judge, the judge has to answer three questions. You know the statute, you read the statute, you know what the questions are. You have, in light of those questions that the judge is going to have to answer, you did an assessment and evaluation and wrote a report giving the judge information for the judge to utilize in helping the judge make his decision. That's all you did, right? That's stated in my report, actually. So whatever you called it, 
You could have called it anything. You could have just titled your report, information helpful for the judge. And signed your names at the end, right? Sure. Same thing as what you did, right? It would be not as precise as what I did, but yeah. Nothing perfect. Are you correct? No, no, thank you, Your Honor. All right, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. You may step down. Judge, I did move in Exhibit 5, correct? Yes, I believe so. Um, he's free to go as far as we're concerned. But you know that you don't have to. You're not subpoenaed by the state. All right, thank you. We have Exhibit 4. We have Exhibit 4. That's all. Any um, more witnesses for today? I do not have additional witnesses for today. I am going to um, revisit later. I re re request that we commence right at 8 a.m. tomorrow. That's what I was going to ask. Um, I, I, we could probably start earlier, but I'll give my expert a chance to get a coffee and meet me, and we'll start right at 8 o'clock tomorrow. Um, I have made a contact with uh, Mr. Wadera, who is the subject of the affidavit. He will be available, he's making himself available by Zoom telephone tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. Uh, I advised him that if necessary, and we'll have to take a break, get his testimony in, it won't be very long. I have my witness at 8 a.m. Uh, based upon what I expect, he should be done by 10 or 10.30. Um, if that's the case, we have another uh, short witness also prepared to testify by Zoom, and she will be available to testify either um, at 10.30 in the morning, if that fits, or she will have to wait until 1.30, because if I don't get her in before noon, she is involved with running a, a meeting between 12 and 1.30, and then after that witness, we will be done. All right, Mr. Newell, how many witnesses do you anticipate? Um, it just depends on what um, the, the testimony from the last two, the, the, the one with the meeting, uh, she also has a subpoena for us, so obviously we won't recall her. So absent something unique coming up with the, the other two witnesses, that would, there wouldn't be any witnesses from the state. All right, so it's a possibility you may finish. Correct. Thanks everyone for their civility. Um, thanks for your hard work. We shall see everybody tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.